Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Collins, it is such a pleasure to have you on. How are you today? I am just fine. It is great to be on your show with you, Bobby. I'm a big fan. So terrific to have a chance to talk about whatever we're going to talk about. You are the director of the National Institutes of Health. What does that mean? That means I'm the guy who oversees our nation's investments in biomedical research. The National Institutes of Health is the way in which discoveries get made and clinical advances occur. And it's my job to oversee all of this in a $42 billion a year medical research investment, which for the past year has been all about COVID-19, as you might guess. And we have made some real progress with vaccines and other things. Well, this is why I'm glad to have you on, because this is the guy to ask about vaccines. I've had one shot. Uh, Eddie's got a shot. Lunchbox has got a shot. Now, we're the inside the two-shot system here because we didn't get Johnson & Johnson. So can you explain to me what the difference is in these three vaccines and if we should look for any of them specifically? Well, let me first say they are all wonderfully effective and safe vaccines. So the bottom line is you should take whatever one gets offered to you as soon as it gets offered, because this is how we're going to get past this terrible COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, those are two shots. They're based on something called messenger RNA. The Johnson & Johnson is one shot, and it's based on an adenovirus approach, but they've all been tested in trials of at least 30,000 people each and been shown to have safety records that are really quite impressive with no hint of any real troubles there and a highly effective way of protecting you against getting sick or dying of COVID-19, and that's what we are all waiting for, and now it is here. So, I know people may be a little resistant about, wait a minute, have, did they rush this? Did they go too fast? I'm the guy who's been overseeing all of this at the NIH. Let me assure you, I've never seen anything done better than this in terms of the way in which the trials were conducted and the strength, therefore, the conclusions about these being safe and effective. So roll up your sleeves, America. It's time to get past this pandemic. Dr. Collins is such a big deal, guys. This is a bigger get than Matthew McConaughey. You know, we had Matthew McConaughey on last week. This is a bigger, better interview in my mind. I know we were all like, we got Matthew McConaughey. This is a better interview. I have so many questions. Okay, here's the next one for you, Dr. Collins. So in the next year, two years or so, we are going to try to have a kid probably, right? And so my fiance, who has one shot, has been like, I'm going to get the shot. But what does this mean if you're trying to have kids? Is this going to affect anything? It is not going to have any effect. So let me do a little myth busting here because there's a lot of myths that are out there being spread around on social media. Uh, This vaccine does not cause infertility, first of all. Uh, By the way, uh, second of all, uh, it also won't give you COVID-19. The vaccine doesn't actually have the virus in it. Just a particular protein that your immune system can recognize is what it's all about. Um, Other myths, no, it does not have chips in it that Bill Gates or Tony Fauci designed. They wouldn't fit through the needle. So, (laughs) yeah, everybody, please look at the CDC if you're looking for information about all of this. It's all up there. CDC.gov is the best place to go if you really want the facts about what we know about the vaccines, their safety, their efficacy. That's the place to look. What about people, because I get hit a lot with, they didn't spend enough time. They rushed this vaccine. I don't want to get it if it's done so quickly. What do you say to that? What do I say to that? Well, I know people are concerned because they heard about this thing called Operation Warp Speed, which maybe wasn't the best choice of a name for the project. But would you rather have Operation Slow Boat? I don't think so. People were dying. We wanted to go as fast as we could to develop these vaccines to save lives. But let me tell you, because I'm right in the middle of this and have been now for the last 15 months, what we did was basically figure out where are the downtimes where nothing happens in between the various phases of vaccine development. And those sometimes take months. And we figured out a way that we could get rid of the downtimes, but not compromise at all on the rest of the rigorous testing to be sure the vaccine was safe and effective. In fact, I think people who look at this would say these are probably vaccines that we know more about than almost any others that have ever been tested. Plus more, the technology that was used, people think maybe it just got invented overnight when COVID-19 burst on the scene back in January 2020. This is all based upon technologies that have been developed over decades that were ready for this moment and got brought forward, and they were. So basically, you took all the time where they were just chilling out, doing nothing, waiting for things but you did everything they would normally do anyway during a vaccine. I'm just trying to understand this, that it wasn't rushed with you just crammed things into a space where it shouldn't have been crammed. You just were extremely efficient 
at finding the vaccine. That's exactly right. So first of all, one of the new technologies made it possible as soon as the Chinese released the actual letters of the viral genome, the the code that that virus uses to replicate itself, to start making the vaccine right then. 63 days later, which is a world record, we are ready to start the very first phase one trials. But then usually there's a big gap between phase one and phase two, not this time. And then there's a big gap between phase two and phase three, not this time. Those were like days instead of months or years. And then the other thing we did, which is really important, Bobby, is we figured that some of these vaccines might actually work. So let's actually start manufacturing doses even before we know if they're going to work. We'll have to throw them out if the vaccine is no good. But if it's good, we'll have them ready to go when once the vaccine gets approved by the FDA people can roll up their sleeves and get started. And that's how we got started in December, as opposed to what otherwise would have been months of waiting for a factory to be built. And maybe we would have had the vaccines by the fall of 2021. We didn't want to have that risk of waiting. So all of this was very carefully planned and it has made it possible in 11 months to do what usually takes five or 10 years. I like that answer, honestly, because I had no idea. I mean, to me, it was just a block of time where it came together quick and I'm going, hey, I'm still trusting people that know more about something than I do. But to actually hear it laid out like that, I'm like, well, that makes sense. And also technology is getting better, too, obviously. So everything should be moving at a bit more rapid rate. OK, I'm pretty confident with that. answer. Like I wouldn't be. We have the, <laughs> the director of the National Institute of Health, Dr. Collins, on with us right now. What if I start questioning him and I'm like, no, I don't know, Dr. Collins. Uh, OK, my fiance and a couple of other friends, they have a little red circle on their shoulder from that shot, like a little rash circle. What Do you know what that is? Or is that just, we're just eating the wrong food? <laughs> well, it's certainly the case that as with any injection, like a flu shot or, or, or a tetanus shot, you can get a local reaction after the needle where it gets a little sore, it may turn a little red. You may even feel for the next 24 hours or so, a headache, maybe even a little chilly, a little feverish. When I had my second dose of Moderna, that's the one I got, I felt pretty uh, puny for 24 hours uh, just because of the effect. But you know what? That's not a side effect. That's an effect. (laughs) That tells you this is working. My immune system has recognized that it has a challenge on its hand. This vaccine is saying, come on, get busy. And it did. And I can tell it did. And now I feel quite well protected because I know my immune system has in its file cabinet the antibodies that it's going to need if I encounter that virus in the future. And that gives me a great sense of confidence that maybe I can actually see my grandchildren in a few more weeks, which would be really nice to be able to do. Yeah, I had some friends. I didn't get sick at all. I felt nothing after my first shot. Um, I have the Pfizer. And I had some friends who, after the second one, for 24, 36 hours, got really sick. Is there a reason that some people are getting sick and some aren't? And should I root to get a little bit sick? Like, is that a good sign? (laughs) You know, my wife just got her second dose and she got Pfizer and she didn't have a bit of a problem. She was just fine. And I was like, boy, you're lucky. And she was like, well, did it really work? Am I okay?" There's a lot of variability, uh, Bobby. It doesn't correlate with whether you got a good antibody response or not. It's something to do with just the way your immune system is wired and, and whether it's like ready to really pull out all the stops when it encounters a challenge or whether it's going to be a little more casual about taking care of business. It, it really, though, everybody who's heard about these side effects, they last maybe 24 hours. Would you rather be kind of sick and chilly for 24 hours or would you rather get COVID-19 and end up in the hospital or the ICU or lose your life? I mean, that's the balance we're trying to help people to understand. And I know there's still people a little on the fence here. I hope those who are listening right now really give it a serious thought about whether this is the time to roll up your sleeve too and join this effort to get this terrible pandemic behind us. Can I stop wearing a mask once I'm fully vaccinated? You know, we don't think it's time yet to stop wearing the mask because it is still possible, although we don't have enough data to be absolutely sure, that you could be vaccinated and you could still carry the virus somewhere in your nose or your respiratory tract, having no symptoms, which means you might then be infecting other people. So until we have more rigorous data about that, which is going to take a few more weeks, Uh, Still recommending that people wear the mask when they're outside around other people. And certainly if you're inside, uh, wear the mask, even though it's a low risk, 
it's the kind of thing it's a love your neighbor thing. It's not about protecting yourself in that situation. It's about whether you might unwittingly be a super spreader and putting people around you at risk. And who would want to do that? So wear the mask, uh, wait a while longer. We're going to get through this. Eventually, we'll be in a situation we can take those off. Now, if you're in a small gathering, uh, maybe a, you invite another couple to dinner at your house, and they're immunized and you're immunized, then everybody can take their masks off and have a nice time together. But if you're in mixed company where some people are not immunized, you still ought to wear the mask to protect those people who are still at risk. Dr. Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health is on with us. I wanna ask a question that isn't extremely about COVID, but I know that you're a devout Christian, you write books, uh, which is extremely interesting in what you write on about the intersection of science and faith. And so the language of God, so what is, tell me what this book is about, because it sounds like something I'd be interested in. Well, thanks for asking. Um, I grew up as a agnostic and ultimately an atheist. And then I went to medical school and had to wrestle with questions about life and death and realized I hadn't really thought this through. And to my surprise, as a scientist and somebody who was interested in genetics, for heaven's sakes, I realized that the atheist perspective was the least rational. That was sort of denying uh, the possibility of God when you don't have complete data. And ultimately, over a couple of years, guided by beginning to understand the Bible and reading a lot of other commentators like C.S. Lewis, to my surprise, I became a Christian. Now, people said, your head's going to explode. <laughs> you can't be a scientist and a Christian, can you? And you know what? Over 40 years, I've never had a problem with this at all. I think science is a wonderful way to understand how nature works, kind of a glimpse of God's mind. But science doesn't answer a lot of questions that I'm interested in, like, why am I here anyway? And is there a God? And does he care about me? And to be able to bring those things together in a harmonious way, which has happened down through human history, except for maybe the last hundred years, uh, seems to me that like something we should try to recapture. And so I wrote this book about how, for me, uh, science is a way of worshiping because you're understanding the creator. And when I study DNA, which is what I did as the leader of the Human Genome Project, I'm studying a language. And for me, God's the creator. That's God's language. So, yeah, that's what the book's about. Um, and a lot of people were surprised that that perspective could be put forward. But there's a whole foundation now called BioLogos, B-I-O-L-O-G-O-S, that has become a meeting place for people who have that same view. And so people interested, go and have a look at that. You'll see a lot of really interesting and respectful conversations going on. Wow, the language of God, that's, that's really interesting. Well, then my final question is, why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's between you and God. So you better get on your knees and see if you can get an answer. I'm still looking for the complete answer myself. But once in a while, I get a glimpse here and there. Well, Dr. Collins, we appreciate your time. And I think that listen, I'm in. I trust science. I got hit with the vaccine. I'm getting my other one uh, first week of April. There are a lot of people in or around my circle that aren't fully in. And I think for them to hear this, this will provide a bit of confidence in the vaccine. Mostly the question of how did this come together so fast? I had no idea. I feel like I'm pretty dialed in. And I had no idea that was really what happened. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for all the hard work you have put in. It has been a busy 2020 for you for sure. And thank you for, you know, coming on the show and explaining, you know, they say explain like I'm five. I feel like we're all five years old <laughs> yes. and you're the teacher. So thank you for doing that with us. <laughs> thank you for the chance. And again, everybody, please uh, look at the evidence and roll up your sleeve when you have uh, the information in front of you. I think that's what you'll want to do. We are going to get through this. Dr. Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Have a great day. Thank you, too. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.